you guys think he died from a drug overdose. You're wrong. You're wrong. Literally. You're wrong. So suck Okay? Suck There's a lot of Y'all don't know that I Myself, when Ali Lottie first dropped this clip on her IG story, I gotta admit, I was hella stressed. Stressed because it made no sense to me at the time. Stressed because it felt like she was just chasing clout. Stressed because I was done with this annoying habit of digging Juice's grave again and again, so I wanted to move on quickly from it. And I would have. But then, this happened. I'm going to break. Well, first I'm going to take it to court because they had me sign an NDA while I was in no state of mind too, while they had brought me drugs and made sure I was high. Do you know that on the day Juice died, no one in the plane saw him take the pills he reportedly overdosed on? And are you aware that Juice got into an altercation with someone a fight the night before that ill-fated flight? Now I'm not saying nothing, but if there was anything, you would expect Allie to know. So it's kind of crazy someone has her under an NDA. What are they trying to hide? What can Allie say that could be so dangerous? Who are the they she was talking about? If you ask me, I'd say the answer to those questions can be found in the last 24 hours of Allie Lottie before Juice World death. The day is 7th of December. The time is roughly 8.15 p.m. and Allie is recording a live video of Juice's last jet ride. At the time, she didn't know it was going to be his last ride. None of them did. Later that night, inside the jet, we see Juice messing around with his homies. He looks happy. He looks well. Nothing seems out of place. Now, if you know anything about the events that led to Juice's tragic demise, then you know that six days before this jet trip, he had already turned 21. You also know his crew had planned for a proper birthday celebration for the 8th, the day after. Juice was supposed to spend it with his mom, his family, and friends. In the meantime, Juice and his crew had arrived at this jet incredibly late. Some say they were two hours late, others say six. Whatever it was, by the time they arrived, the pilot was pissed. It might have been a private flight, but there was a schedule and they were way off. Now, one question no one has ever bothered to ask that I feel is super important is why were they late? What were they doing on the day of the flight that caused them so much delay? And did it have anything to do with the altercation from the night before? Allie says she was out getting her beauty treatment on the day of the flight and juice was at home supposedly getting ready for their flight um by the time i got home he was in the studio but he was really high and it was like daytime mm -hmm. like we need to pack daytime like because in a little bit we're gonna have to leave go on the jet around like you know eight ish i remember he just wasn't paying attention and I was like, you need to start getting ready because I'm going to be getting my these things done. I don't need to tell you that. Juice had a serious drug problem. It was common knowledge and he didn't try to hide it. So let's talk about what likely happened when Allie was out of the house. Again, if you are familiar with the events that led to the Juice tragic demise, then you know that he and his crew carried a lot of luggage with them into the plane. And in those bags was 70 pounds of cannabis along with ammunition. If you're not familiar with how Americans measure stuff, 70 pounds is a whole lot. That's about 30 33 kilograms worth of cannabis. And if you still can't visualize that, it is the weight equivalent of 2,310 iPhones. They were moving heavy, all right. And my theory is that that was what delayed them. But did Juice know about it? And did he have anything to do with the luggage in any way? That's the problem. Because of reasons you will soon come to learn, we will never know the true depth of Juice's involvement. But then that leaves us with Ali Lottie. Did she know there was cannabis in the luggage? Well, that's where things get tricky. In her interview, Ali kept talking about the night before. She kept saying something had happened the night before the trip without stating what exactly talking vaguely about it before slipping into a rant about how she hates planes when he was good i was good everyone was good you know what i mean from what i from what i knew but again i didn't know a lot of stuff had happened the night before but from what i knew everything was good and then we go on the plane everyone knows i'm terrified of being on planes in general previously from this but obviously this is a huge thing but what was the stuff that happened from the night before? Allie never says. But for now, we'll assume that it probably had something to do with the suitcase of 70 pounds of cannabis. Now, you must know that Allie isn't really a saint when it comes to drugs and the movement of it. She has had her fair share of drug cases with the law. But the one that stuck out the most in the immediate aftermath of Juice's death had to do with a thread that went viral on Twitter. This thread claimed, with receipts, that Allie Lottie was not only
only a drug dealer, she had also been convicted for trafficking meth, cocaine, and heroin. This charge reportedly got her a two and a half year sentence. It was wild when it dropped, but it was later debunked as false. Because if Allie had really gotten time on those charges, she would have never met Juice. But whoever served the time had her exact name, Alicia Leon, and the chance of that happening is trippy to say the least. Now let's ignore who knew where what was and focus on who actually put that amount of cannabis in the bag on the flight. Because once again, there's no way on earth it was Juice. There's no scenario where Juice was getting and smuggling 70 pounds of weed in their luggage on a private jet and with guns. My guess, it was his crew. When I first met him, yeah. I said, I told him like, Lucy Dreams is her best song. And then he was like, you think so? He said, you wanna know something, baby? That's the only song that I sat down and I thought about. Wow. So I said, well, you know what that means? You should probably sit down and think about another song. This man right here is Lil Bibby, co-founder of Grade A Productions, a record label, the same label that Juice World was signed to, the same label that would later sign him onto a multi-million dollar joint venture deal with Interscope Records. Lil Bibby was the one who gave Juice his first true commercial platform and structure, and he was also on that ill-fated flight. After they had arrived late and found the pilot in his feelings, members of the Juice crew would say they felt something was off, and at least one of them wanted to leave the plane at the time, a move that might or might not have saved Juice's life. We'll never know. What we do know is that they felt something was off and they were right because somehow at the airport in illinois chicago the same airport they were scheduled to land in a few hours the police and the feds were waiting for them to land did someone tell them about the weed in the luggage how would they have even known the popular theory is that the pilot alerted them but how did he know what was sealed in a luggage out of his own sight and reach see i'm not going to go down this rabbit hole again no one knows for certain if the pilot informed them and no one will ever know except you can track the pilot in question and extract it from him yourself. We have bigger fish to fry, and it has everything to do with why on earth the feds were at the airport waiting for them. You see, I can understand why both the police would be waiting for them, but the FBI's presence was oddly specific and also pretty confusing. But hey, not everyone was confused. It was only confusing for those who knew nothing of Lil Bibby affiliations, confusing to those who knew nothing of the No Limit Gang, confusing to those who didn't know that just a few days before Juice and his crew got on this flight, there was a gruesome murder in the city of Chicago, and Juice's crew along with Lil Bibby were neck deep in it. Shoot him shells, Mr. Death 150. Yeah, I know I be catching y'all stupid ass. You know? And I got But you know, everybody telling me to leave the, um, the other alone that's folks on his music. And they right. So I'm gonna do that, you know? Stay out the way. This was the dude known as Shooter Shells. He was a rapper and street gang banger, and the way they took him out was a brutal affair. Some say it was the most brutal that the city of Chicago had ever seen, but many knew he had it coming because of the extremely volatile lifestyle he had lived up until his terrible demise. Shooter Shells was a member of a Chicago gang called Black Mob. When he was serving time behind jail, his brother was killed by a No Limit gang member. So when he got out, he got on a revenge streak with kamikaze sensibilities. I say kamikaze because Shooter Shells didn't know when to stop. The man stacked up at least five No Limit bodies in the course of his revenge, but for some reason that wasn't enough. In 2017, he released a diss track on YouTube titled Death of 150, which was a brutal diss to the No Limit Gang. This turned out to be the last straw. Three months later on the 10th of July, 2017, someone gave up his location and as he was getting into his car, in broad daylight at around 9.32 a.m., a white Nissan Altima pulled up beside him. Three shooters hopped out and fired shots at him, but shooter shells didn't die immediately. He staggered and fell to the ground half alive, half dead. So these three shooters gathered around and fired several rounds of bullets each into his head. I can't show you the photos for very obvious reasons. Just know that when the police arrived, they recovered 43 shell casings near his body. When the cops would come around to round up suspects, their prime culprit was a rapper named Mad Max. And unsurprisingly, he was a member of the No Limit Gang. Okay. So what does this have to do with Juice, Lil Bibby, and the luggage of meth and guns found in the plane? Well, Lil Bibby is also a member of the No Limit Gang. Artists signed to the label like G Herbo, who was also signed to Lil Bibby's label, and a frequent collaborator of Juice was also a member of the No Limit Gang. In fact, almost everyone who was under and around Lil Bibby's circle was linked to the gang in one way or the other. In fact, it was Herbo that Shooter Shells had had beef with. But funny enough, Shooter Shells had gone on record saying that he had nothing but respect for Lil Bibby, even though he was a No Limit gang member. His reason was that the homie never dissed him or his black mob gang. This turned out to be a rookie mistake. He was giving Bibby too much credit because in the lead up to his own gruesome demise, Bibby would be quoted indirectly dissing shooter shells in these lyrics from Got Him Sick. Beefing with the gang, you might find him in a ditch. Heard that you...
been talking that sh I just been calm, you know I can switch. You know I'm a savage. I ride with the stick. I make a call and I get him hit. Now, I'm not saying shooter shells was slow. His decision to exclude Bibby from the beef was no error because Bibby had always been about the money. He wasn't really interested in street politics or any of that small time sh that could get in the way of him making some bands. All he was interested in was getting paper and he wasn't gonna let anyone or anything get between him and the money, not even his own music career. I've been a student since I got in. You know how most artists, they get in and say, I just want to rap. They let their people do the business. No, I, I be wanting to know everything. I feel like that, that kind of like affected my career a little bit because I want to play every role, you know? And he had had this kind of mindset from the jump because when the Chicago drill scene first started to gain traction online back in 2012, names such as Chief Keef, Lil Durk, G Herbo, and Lil Bibby were some of the biggest in the industry. And it was his eye and ear for talent that allowed him make the seamless transition from rapper to record label executive to signing Juice immediately. He listened to Lucid Dreams. In his words, he called it the best music he had ever listened to. So maybe Shooter Shells was actually slow, because anyone who knows anything about anything would tell you that the corporate world of the music industry is tougher and more diabolical than anything you'd find on the streets. I mean, the streets could prep you for that life, but the industry would still humble the hell out of you if you aren't ruthless. So while Shooter Shells was gunning for G Herbo, if he was really interested in crippling No Limit, he should have been targeting Bibby. Why? Well, because in my opinion, he was the one holding it all together, at least financially. But on top of that, he was also the most strategic and most calculating member of the No Limit gang. You don't fear the monster under the light, you fear the one hiding in the shadows. So now we know why the feds were waiting for Juice when his plane landed in Chicago at 1.30 a.m. on the 8th of December, 2019. He was in bad, bad company. At least an hour before they arrived, the cops had arrested Juice's personal bodyguard, Henry Dean. Henry was not on the private jet, but was waiting with a limousine service so he could take them to their cribs. Henry Dean had seen the officers enter the airport, and he had sent messages to the crew that there were officers on ground waiting for them, messages that they wouldn't get until they themselves had landed. It was when the crew were getting close, Henry Dean entered the airport to help everyone that was on board the flight with their luggage, but then the officers stopped him. Two firearms were found on him. And while he had a valid firearms owner ID as well as a concealed carry license, the license did not allow him to carry a concealed firearm inside an airport. So he was cuffed and arrested. During this time, everyone was seated. Juice, Chris Long, Lil Bibby, G Herbo, every other member of the No Limit crew except Ali Lottie. Immediately they got to the lounge. Ali took a bathroom break. At the same time, K-9 dogs began to search the luggages. A police K-9 dog then immediately indicated a positive alert on a suitcase on the first cart. That was where they found the 70 pounds of marijuana in 41 vacuum sealed bags and six bottles of liquid prescription codeine cough syrup. Allie returned from the bathroom and Juice turned to him, muttered something incoherent before collapsing to the ground with a seizure. Blood was coming from Juice's mouth and nostrils. The officers asked if Juice had suffered from any medical issues and if he had ingested any drugs. He didn't have any medical issues, but he had a drug problem. That's what they told the officers. So they administered Narcan to stop the overdose. Juice was placed in an ambulance en route to Holy Cross Hospital. Meanwhile, while Chris Long, Juice's close friend and PA, had gotten into a bit of trouble. K-9 found more cannabis in the second bag and three firearms, including two 9mm pistols and a 40 caliber pistol along with metal piercing bullets and a high capacity ammunition magazine. The 40 caliber pistol was hidden inside a bag that contained camera equipment. When they asked who the bag belonged to, Chris Long claimed ownership of the bag, but denied having any knowledge of there being a firearm inside. Chris Long would then be arrested and charged with unlawful possession of a firearm at around 2.03 a.m. on December 8, 2019. A little over an hour later, Juice World would be pronounced dead at 3.14 a.m. This morning, so many questions as to how a seeming healthy 21 year old could die so unexpectedly. It was tragic and you can imagine how heated the emotions were on that night but there was no time to grieve just yet because the cops needed an explanation for who owned the 70 pounds of weed in their luggage and this is when things took a bizarre turn. You would think either the feds, homeland, the cops or the gang unit would be able to pin the drugs on one of the occupants but they couldn't. According to official police reports, none of the suitcases carrying the drugs had names or personal items attached and no drug charges were filed. Of course, the most reasonable explanation was that no limits owned it, but the police just couldn't prove it. Now, the question you might want to ask is why on earth would they use Juice's plane to move that kind of incriminating cargo? You would think their number one priority would be protecting their most profitable asset, Juice. Juice was on the clear and broad path to superstardom. There was no denying this fact. And you could argue that it was the numbers his records were doing that even kept Lil Bibby's label relevant, if not profitable. 
Well, you want to know what I think? You might not like it, but I strongly believe they were using Juice as a mule, a patsy, a cow that carried all of the goods, a goose laying golden eggs. The reason I am convinced this is true is because of videos like these. While we said we smoking on ghosts, smoking on Katie Pack and Pasto and Mr. The Most, man, <laughs> I'm a killer, you know it though. In this clip, Juice disses two guys, one named Pasto and another named Lil Mister. At the time he dissed them, both rappers were already dead. But you gotta know by now he wasn't just dissing individuals, he was dissing the gangs they represented. Gangs that were bitter ops of, you guessed it, the No Limit Gang. Pasto was a member of a Chicago gang called Lakeside. And back in November of 2013, at the age of just 18, he was brutally murdered, shot in the head while standing in a building somewhere in Chicago. Juice didn't know this dude from nowhere because when the dude was killed, Juice was a 15-year-old high schooler in the south suburbs of Illinois. If Bibby and the crew really cared about Juice, they would have shut him up, told him to stay in his lane. He was an emo rapper who wore his heart on his sleeves and every one of his fans loved him for it. He didn't need to be gangster. The second dude Juice dissed in that clip, Lil Mister, was a popular Chicago drill rapper and member of a Chicago gang called Wooga World. He was fatally shot in a drive-by on March 15th, 2019, eight months before Juice himself would pass. Now, I searched the internet and couldn't find any record of a beef between Juice and Lil Mister prior to the latter or the former's death. Juice was just inheriting beef and he was doing it to fit in. Just like Pac suddenly started moving gangster when he got out of jail and got signed to death row. Juice had adopted the persona of a No Limit gang member without the street cred. If he was still alive and he continued this way while remaining with Bibby's label, it would have probably led to violent outcomes. But you see, that's the problem. With how fast Juice was moving, there was no scenario in the multiverse where Juice stayed with Grade A. And it wasn't because Juice would have wanted to leave, it was because Grade A would have been too small to keep him from leaving. By now, 2023, Juice would have been in the top 10, if not top five artists in the world. Not rappers, I'm talking about musical artists across all genres. And it would make zero sense for him not to own his own label. So, what would you do if you were grade A? What would you do if you were in charge of the fastest growing artist on the planet and there suddenly his head was touching the ceiling, pulling the rug from under your feet and possibly bringing down the whole house? If you think what I'm suggesting is crazy, then look no further than how things fell apart with Kid Leroy the moment he left grade A. For those familiar with the rise of Kid Leroy to superstardom, long before he released the monster hit Stay with Bieber, the teenager was signed under grade A and Juice was kinda like his mentor and big brother. He worked closely with him, learning under Juice till he passed. Leroy was even on the flight with Juice and the rest of the crew on that terrible night. In an HBO doc on Juice's life, the singer says, he was so ill. I was just sitting there panicking. I was like, what the f And at first we just thought he was having a seizure and then the blood started coming out of his mouth and his nose. Despite all of this, Leroy stayed with Grade up until 2020. He even called Lil Bibby his big brother and mentor in an interview with Hot New Hip Hop Mag in that same year. But no one knew he had an exit plan an exit plan that came in the form of Scooter Braun. Because I mean, if there's anyone that can make gangster CEOs feel emo, it would have to be Scooter freaking Braun. That's the man that took on Taylor Swift and her horde of Swifters and came out without a scratch. But we're getting distracted. Leroy's departure didn't sit well with Bibby or his partners at Grade A. When the Stay crooner did a cover story with Billboard after the fact, they asked the rising superstar what happened with Grade A. But reps from Columbia jumped in to decline comment. And when Leroy eventually got the chance to speak about Grade A, he said, simply responded, we won't talk about them. So is there a possibility that Juice had started showing signs of wanting to leave grade A? Is there a possibility that someone decided that Juice would be more useful to the label dead than alive? Well, if anyone is gonna suggest something that extreme or incriminating, that person has gotta weigh the odds. What did grade A stand to lose if Juice had left the label like Kid Leroy later did? Well, since Juice was the goose that laid the golden egg, they were definitely gonna lose the goose. And if that goose had a good enough lawyer, then he would probably take the eggs he'd previously laid with him. But hey, you say, what would grade A gain from Juice's passing? And seriously, I'm stunned you're asking that question. In the immediate aftermath of Juice's passing, Forbes reported that Juice had at least 3,000 unreleased songs. The metaphorical goose laid enough metaphorical eggs to reduce its literal relevance. No disrespect. Everyone knew Juice's work ethic was phenomenal. Jared's work ethic mm. was something that I would literally, I cannot even just say applaud, like I would kiss his feet to, like every night for it. Like his worth ethic was something that 
I've never seen anyone be able to do. Now, if there's a drop of truth in this theory we just explored, then his work ethic worked against him. And since his death up to this day, Grade A has been the custodian of Juice's legacy, which means they get almost complete access and control of his catalog, which includes existing songs and unreleased songs and collaborations. And if you are a fan of the deceased rappers, you know the mess they've made of his legacy up until now. From botched releases to unending leaks to erasing features that Grade A didn't like whether or not Juice would have wanted them, many fans are convinced that the label has done more to damage Juice's legacy than even Ally herself. Ally might not be a saint, but she's not the biggest devil on the playground. I'm trying my best to give you the dots and leave you to connect them. But if you still think it's all cap, if you think the allegations against Grade A is misplaced, if you think Kid Leroy was just being a child and Ally was just acting cuckoo, I'll leave you with one last exhibit, Max Lord. When Grade A began releasing Juice's posthumous albums, Ally was one of the many people who claimed that the label was mishandling his music. And Max Lord was one of the very few people who came to her defense. Max Lord was one of Juice World's closest music engineers. And the reason why he spoke up was because Grade A had tried to rough him up. He tweeted, I left my house as soon as I heard the news of Juice's death out of fear for my safety from them on the advice of my attorney. But it gets worse. He also says that there were open threats against him from Grade A and that they were demanding for all his recording equipment, even going as far as threatening kill him if he didn't comply. Do I need to tell you why they were doing this? Funny thing is, Max Lord also says that when Juice was alive, Grade A tried to make him record on beats he hated and that it had happened the night before his death. On the night before that ill-fated flight, there was a physical altercation between Max Lord, a co-founder of Grade A named G Money, and Juice over beats that the Grade A execs were convinced would make them money. If you enjoyed this expose, click on a video on your screen to watch even more interesting mini-documentaries like this one, and I'll see you there.